Since it took office, families are carrying less debt. Their average savings are up. A recent survey from the Federal Reserve found that more Americans feel financially comfortable than any time since the survey began in 2013. The two challenges on the minds of most working families are prices at the pump and prices at the grocery store. Both of these challenges have been directly exacerbated by Putin's war in Ukraine. The price of gas is up $1.40 since the beginning of the year when Putin began amassing troops at the Ukrainian border. This is a Putin price hike. Putin's war has raised the price of food because Ukraine and Russia are two of the world's major breadbaskets for wheat and corn, the basic product for so many foods around the world. Ukraine has 20 million tons of grain in storage right now, and it's been in storage since the last harvest. Normally, that would have already been exported into the world market. But because of Putin's invasion and blockade of the port by which they could take that grain out for the rest of the world, it's not. If food and gas prices are going to be elevated by Putin's price hike, one way we can make things a little better for families is by helping them save on other basic items their family needs on a monthly basis, like their utility bills, their internet bills, their prescription drug bills, and other costs like housing. My goal is to make sure that at the end of the month, families have a little more breathing room than they, than they have now. For example, here's something we can do right now. Congress would help ease the cost for families right away by passing my clean energy investment proposal that I propose that's been sitting there. Things like tax credits for businesses to produce clean energy. The tax cuts for families to make their homes more energy efficient. That's what it results in. I met with nearly a dozen CEOs of America's largest utility companies, such as Southern Company and American Electric Power. They told me that if we pass the investments, they will make immediately lower, they'll immediately lower the average family's energy cost by about $500 a year. That would help a lot. That'd make up for a lot. In the long run, it would help families make America truly energy independent. So in the future, American families are no longer subject to the whims of a dictator half a world away controlling oil. Good morning from Athens, Greece. It is around 9.30 on this Saturday morning. And we have got to talk about what you just saw right there in that video segment, that little video montage of U.S. President Joe Biden giving a, a speech about the state of uh, the U.S. economy. And uh, he talked about inflation and the, and the Putin price hikes and uh, his plan going forward, which is very revealing. And uh, we will talk about Putin and an interview that he gave the other day after his meeting with uh, the African Union leader, Macky Sall. I believe he is the president, president or prime minister of Senegal, but he is also the head of the African Union. And he met with Putin and then Putin gave an interview right after that. And Putin talks about the, uh, the world economy and uh, he gives his thoughts, which is uh, a very, very stark contrast between what Putin says and what Biden says. And then we'll talk about how Ursula van der Kreese continues to push for uh, the Ukraine to enter the European Union. We will also talk about how Ukraine is already backtracking on their assurances that they gave the United States with regards to uh, the long-range missiles, the HIMARS, and how Ukraine assured the U.S. that they would not uh, use those long-range missiles to, to strike at Russia. So we've got a lot of news to get to. And, um, hmm. And we'll also do a, a clown world as well. So, all right. Let's talk about Biden's statement. Man, Biden is, that, that was one bizarre, bizarre speech that Biden gave. So he's bringing back the Putin price hikes uh, 
talking point, that, that, that little mean narrative that his uh, White House press team thought uh, would really, you know, drive home the point that Biden is not to blame for the economic troubles of, uh, of the United States, but it's, it's Putin and the Putin price hike and the fact that Putin um, went to war with Ukraine, is according to the, to the Biden White House, the fact that uh, Putin went to war with Ukraine and uh, he has caused all this trouble and that is why we have the, uh, the inflation that we have and the energy shortages and the food shortages and the wheat and grain shortages. Long story short, the, uh, the Biden, the Biden uh, PR team decided that they're going to try to pin all the problems that uh, the Biden White House has on Putin, specifically on Putin, because um, and not Russia. They always use Putin. They never say Russia because they want to personalize it. But um, But uh, yeah, so that was one bizarre, bizarre speech. He says it's uh, that he tells the American people that all your problems are due to Putin and the war in Ukraine and uh, inflation is is being caused by the Putin price hikes and any shortages that the United States may have going forward are due to the Putin price hikes and the war in Ukraine. And then he, he says that uh, statistics are showing, I don't know what statistics he's, uh, he's using, but uh, statistics show that Americans are happier, more comfortable than ever before in history. And uh, something along those lines is what, is what he said, some crazy statement like that. And uh, I mean, you guys saw the video and, and I was just listening to him going, where are you getting this information? I mean, it's obvious that whatever stats the Biden White House is pulling from, it's um, these are stats that that they're getting from the lockdowns up until today. So they're basically just saying, let's get the numbers as to how the economy was during the lockdowns. And then we'll see where the economy is today. And those will be our uh, stats to show incredible job growth and uh, and all of these things. So that's obviously how they're pulling these numbers. And um I'm, I'm, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> so yes, yeah, he, uh, Biden, he, he then makes these crazy claims about how Americans are super duper wealthy and super duper comfortable. So he talks about how Whatever problems you have, you can blame it on Putin with the economy. So just blame it on Putin. And he then goes on to say that his administration has, uh, has led to the standard of living of, uh, of Americans to be higher than ever before. Or at least higher than when uh, the country was locked down during the coup. <laughs> That's what he really means. Things are better now. The economy is doing better uh, because uh, we don't have any more lockdowns. So that's... That's the Biden White House's logic there. But uh, then he gets to the big reveal, what I think was the big reveal. And that has to do with the fact that uh, Biden's plan going forward, the way he's going to save the economy and stop inflation is by printing more money. And all the money that he's going to print is going to go to services which are connected to climate, renewables, Green New Deal. And there you have the big reveal. It's all about the Green New Deal, the Great Reset, isn't it? Blame everything bad on Putin. Lie to the people that uh, 
that things are really not that bad. That's the weird part about it. All the bad, blame it on Putin, but at the same time, tell people that things aren't really that bad. At least, because of me, things are not bad. Anything good is because of me. Anything bad is because of Putin. And by the way, we're going to print more money and we're going to throw all that money into Green New Deal related projects. Print more money, that's going to bring down inflation. <laughs> so anyway, that was the bizarre, very bizarre speech from Biden. But it, it does have a, a reveal. It does uh, give us an insight as to what's really going on. And that is, this is uh, all about the, uh, the Great Reset and green energy and renewables and the Green New Deal and just shoving it down our throats. That's why the first thing Biden did when he became president was he shut down the Keystone Pipeline. And that is why he's, uh, he keeps on doing what he is doing with regards to uh, energy in the United States, energy security and production in the United States. And that is why he is, uh, he's being puppeted to, um, to talk up the, the White House's green initiatives while at the same time blaming all the bad on Russia. So let's shift gears now to talk about, here's Odessa. Wow, they really, uh, they really got this street covered, don't they? in a big, big way. The polling in Greece shows that the Greeks are pretty, pretty much 70, 75% in support. I don't want to say in support, but uh, they're, they're not anti-Russian, the population. It hasn't worked. Like a lot of, of this has not worked. Uh, the Greeks and as the, the economic situation really deteriorates here because of the, of the sanctions from uh, the European Union, the Greeks are hardening their stance and they're not buying into this Putin price hikes, Russia did it narrative. And that number is at like 70%. When, when, when the war started, when the conflict started, the Greeks were, uh, were pretty anti-Russian, at least the public sentiment, but it's really shifted a whole bunch since... Uh, the blowback from, from the sanctions and because the Greeks are starting to get the truth as to what's really happening. But um, speaking of Russia, and by the way, those polling numbers also carry through to the United States as well. I was reading uh, an article from The Hill which said that when the, the conflict, the special military operation started, 60, 65% of Americans were supportive of the United States of some involvement of the United States in the conflict with Ukraine, i.e. economic aid, weapons deliveries, stuff like that. Now that number has dropped to like 45%. So let's talk about the Russian president and uh, his statements. So Vladimir Putin met with um, the African Union leader, Mr. Macky Sall from Senegal. And uh, the African Union leader pretty much went to, uh, to Russia and he wants to find a solution for, for what could become a, a food crisis. And uh, the meeting went well and, and Putin pretty much said that Russia is, is going to work with uh, Africa to, uh, to figure out a way to get food and fertilizer to, uh, to the continent. And um, that was pretty much the, the gist of, of the meeting between the two uh, gentlemen. Um, the African Union is, is looking for a way to, to prevent um, food shortages and fertilizer shortages. And uh, Russia said they're, they're going to, uh, to help out. They're on board to help out. But after the meeting with the African Union leader, uh, Putin gave an interview. And uh, he talked about many of the accusations, for example, the Putin price hikes, that the West is leveling towards uh, Russia. And uh, Putin was, let me actually, let me, should I sit down for this to read it? Yeah, let me sit down. Let me sit down so I can read this. 
because what Putin says is, is pretty interesting. Okay, let me pull it up. So Putin said that Russia is ready to aid in transporting uh, Ukrainian grain, but Western sanctions make it impossible. That's something that Putin said. Uh, he noted that uh, there is no naval blockade in, uh, in Ukraine, but what's really happening is a number of things. Number one is that uh, you have the issue of the mines. The Russia is working now to demine the area, and they've opened up two corridors for uh, ships to leave. Two. They've had one open for, for a while now, and they opened up a second corridor right uh, at the Mariupol port. The other problem with, uh, with the grain is that uh, the EU has sanctioned Russian ships. So Russia can't really do much about it because any of the ships coming out of, uh, of Ukraine to transport wheat have been sanctioned. And another issue that, uh, that Russia is facing or that the world is facing with regards to uh, the wheat problem is that um, the EU has sanctioned or is on the way to sh sanctioning ship insurers. So this is another obstacle for uh, the transporting of, of, uh, of wheat. But more importantly, Putin made an excellent point saying, you know what, all of this getting the wheat out by ship is, is well and good. But uh, the easiest way, Putin said, to get the, the wheat to the European markets is to just simply transport it via Belarus, which is the simplest easiest way and Putin made a point to uh, to say that this is the way that uh, it's been done in the past over and over again he said it's the cheapest way as well the Russian leader called the Belarus transport route and that's this is, a, this is a quote the cheapest way of getting Ukrainian grain to customers around the world and here's the key line yet using it would require that Western nations lift the sanctions they imposed against Minsk. The whole wheat grain problem, as Putin notes, is not the fault of Russia. It's the fault of collective West sanctions, not only against Russia, but also against Belarus. And very much in the same way that Biden is trying to put all the blame on the uh, the economic problems of the United States on Russia in the same way the EU, the collective West, the US is trying to put all the blame of potential food shortages on Russia when in fact this could easily be solved by lifting sanctions on, uh, on boats, demining, lifting sanctions on boats, not sanctioning insurers, making sure that uh, those ships can, uh, can deliver the, the grain to Europe, but even easier is just lift the sanctions on Belarus and on Russia so that they can transport the wheat, the grain, the fertilizer, whatever, with the easiest and cheapest uh, route available, which is overland into uh, Europe. And that is what Putin said in his statements. Putin also uh, noted that, you know, the, the inflation problems and, uh, and the energy shortages, much of this uh, existed before the special military operation. And uh, a lot of this was due to collective West money printing. And that is why you have a lot of the inflation and the energy problems. So we've been talking about this at the Duran for a long, long time, how coming out of the, the lockdowns, and opening up the economy, all the Biden administration had to do was do nothing. The U.S. was, uh, was in a very good position, and much of the world was in a very good position to just let their economies move forward without any interference after the lockdowns. Open up the, your economies and do nothing, and just let the, the economies do what they're going to do. Let the markets do what they're going to do. But what did the Biden White House do? And what did the EU do? They printed money. 
and they poured trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy. They put their foot on the accelerator and they just sped the car, bam, right into a freaking wall. And uh, they overheated everything. And that is why you have much of the problems you have. Now it's all been exacerbated because of the uh, sanctions. The sanctions aren't helping, especially in, uh, with regards to energy. But Putin made, made it a point to say that, look, all of these problems that we're facing now, a lot of it is due to your money printing after you... Uh, after your economies came out of the coup and, uh, and the lockdowns. And Putin is absolutely correct. And he said, don't blame this on Russia. The acceleration of inflation was associated with the ill-conceived actions of the United States to inject funds into the economy and not with the actions of the Russian Federation in Ukraine. He also said that Russia has nothing to do with the situation with rising gas prices. The short-sighted policy of the European Commission in the field of energy in recent years is to blame for everything. He's completely correct. Completely correct there. All of this that we're seeing right now is a result of collective West policy and collective West actions. Now, these actions were either deliberate, i.e., like Biden said in the opening video to usher in the, uh, the Great Reset, which is what he pretty much admitted. We're going to pump more money into the economy and just give it to, to green stuff, to green initiatives and renewables. So all of this is deliberate in order to get more money to, uh, to the renewable sector and to force people to, to live the, the Klaus Schwab the Klaus Schwab Great Reset life <laughs> or and or these policies were put in place by US and EU officials because they're just plain incompetent and stupid. Maybe it's one, maybe it's the other. It's probably a combination of both. Throw in the neocons who uh, love a good war and you have the problems that we have today. So let's move on now to, what should we talk about? Let's talk about Ursula van der Krazy. So Ursula van der Krazy was uh, at another conference, one of these globalist conferences, I believe in, I think Slovakia, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, she was at a globalist conference and she was talking about how it's the EU's moral, moral obligation to uh, put Ukraine into the, uh, into the European Union. Even though the Ukraine is not ready to go into the European Union, you have Mark Rutte and Macron specifically stating that Ukraine will need 20 years to get into the EU. Ursula van der Krazy said, you know what, forget all that. Forget our rules, forget our requirements. We have a moral obligation to put Ukraine into the EU. And so, Ursula has been itching to get Ukraine into the EU at all costs. I say, go for it. I say, why not? Let Ukraine, whatever that's going to be, whatever that's going to mean in six months, let them into the European Union. <laughs> and uh, whatever happens, happens. You know, if uh, she's so hell-bent on getting them into the EU, let, uh, let the chips fall where they may. <laughs> and let's see what happens. Um, <laughs> in this instance, I'm agreeing with Macron and uh, Rutte. And I agree with their stance that, look, you can't let Ukraine into the EU because the EU will absolutely implode. But you know what? Let Ursula have her way and uh, let's put Ukraine into the European Union tomorrow and, uh, <laughs> and God help, God help Europe. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's now talk about, um, where should I go here? Let's go this way. Let's, uh, 
talk <laughs> about how Ukraine is already going back on their assurances with regards to the uh, high Mars and the long range missiles. So Blinken came out with a statement just yesterday and he said, look, once again, according to as as uh, what Joe Biden said the other day, I, uh, I confirmed that the Ukraine, the Alensky regime, they have given us assurances that these uh, high Mars systems I think they're going to send something like four is the is the final tally as to how many of these uh, of these long range missile systems they're going to send to Ukraine. But anyway, these uh, long range missiles, Ukraine has given us their assurances. They have promised they've absolutely promised their word. Their word is their bond. And they have said they will not use these uh, these systems to strike at Russia. OK. There you have it. Ukraine has given their word. All is good, right? But uh, Ukraine has come out in 24 hours and they have said, nah, don't, don't buy into what, uh, let's go this way. This looks interesting. Don't buy into what uh, Blinken or, or Biden, don't buy into what they say. <laughs> Forget about them. We're gonna use these, uh, these weapons to hit at Russia. So Adestovich, who's uh, the BFF of Alensky, and he's one of Alensky's uh, actor friends, and um, he's now the, the minister of uh, propaganda <laughs> in Ukraine. He's the Baghdad Bob of uh, Ukraine, and uh, the, the, the court jester. If Alensky's the clown, Adestovich is the court jester. And he came out on, uh, on a Ukraine-like TV channel during an interview, and he said, you know what? Forget about what Blinken and Biden say with regards to uh, using these weapons to uh, not strike at Russia. We're going to use these weapons and we're going to hit at Crimea. Because, according to Aristovich, Crimea is, uh, is Ukraine territory. And um, we have the right to, to send missiles into Crimea. And so Aristovich made these claims on television in Ukraine going against in just 24 hours going against the assurances that uh, Biden and Blinken were talking up the other day. So you don't only have Adestovich. If it was just Adestovich, I would say, OK, he's a clown. He's a court jester. He says a lot of stupid stuff. That's fine. But the Crimea thing is is uh, is very dangerous because um, the United States can also say if, if, and this is a long, long shot, but let's just say if Ukraine manages to get a missile into Crimea, well, you know, the, U the U.S. could say, well, we consider Crimea to be Ukrainian territory, so those assurances were not broken. So it, it, it's a very dangerous, um, this is a very dangerous play here with uh, the missiles and Crimea, as far as Crimea is concerned. The same goes for uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. They could uh, take those missiles and uh, manage to sneak one into uh, Donetsk and Lugansk. And they could come out with the same claim, saying, well, we don't consider these, uh, these cities or these regions to be Russian territory. Thus, our assurances, are, um, our assurances hold. Katerini. Let's go inside. And so you also had, and if it was just uh, Adestovich, I would say whatever. You can kind of see the sign here. The church of Aya and Katerini. I don't know if you guys can see it. But uh, you also had the. Uh, the new U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and um, she was meeting with Elensky, and she said that, uh, and this is incredible, wow, I can just go down here? Hmm. I did not know. So I'm in like, I'm on a side street off of the Blaka Acropolis area. And, uh, yeah, wow. 
this area is new to me. This little church area. So um, the ambassador to the U.S., the new ambassador to the U.S. in Kiev, I'm, I'm starting and I'm stopping, but you know, <laughs> I'm distracted here. She, uh, she said that uh, the assurances are null and void. Like the U.S. ambassador to Kiev comes out 24 hours after the Biden New York Times op-ed, after Blinken uh, confirmed the Ukraine assurances as well in a press statement. The U.S. ambassador, now she works for Blinken. Technically, she works for the State Department, the Secretary of State. She works for Anthony Blinken. She comes out as the newly appointed ambassador to Kiev, first day on the job, and she says that uh, those assurances are null and void. Okay. And yeah. that uh, Ukraine is going to decide what type of missiles they're going to get and the range of those missiles. No joke. So it took 24 hours for those assurances to be scrapped, according to Aristovich and according to the U.S. ambassador in Kiev. So much for, uh, for Ukraine um, promises, huh? for Elensky promises. I'm never comfortable, quite comfortable, going in with a camera to a church. I mean, you can. I think you can film inside a church, but I've never been comfortable with it. So I just kind of showed you a little bit of the inside. Let's, uh, let's do a clown world. And uh, this will be a quick clown world. Let me see here. Now, I, I, I don't know if this... Uh, I got this from Russian media. And it was sent to me from, uh, from a viewer who's uh, monitoring Russian media. And I know this is a true story a month ago, but I don't know if this is still the case. <laughs> anyway, and the reason I'm bringing up this clown world is because um, I think this is what's coming to all of the collective West very, very soon. But I think it's hitting Latvia earlier than most uh, countries, or at least it's hitting a village in Latvia. And it has to do with a village called uh, Rezekne. It's about 27,000 people. And in the beginning of uh, May, they decided to turn off the hot water. Now, at first, they were making excuses, the officials in, uh, in uh, Rezekne, they were making excuses saying, you know, we have to cut off the hot water because of maintenance or certain, certain things that we have to do, structural maintenance things that we have to do, and we're going to cut off the hot water for a little bit. But then they... Uh, they kind of revealed that, you know what, we're going to cut off the hot water because the price is uh, just going to be too much to, to maintain hot water in this village. Specifically, 198 euros per megawatt hour is what, uh, what the price was going to be for hot water in this village in Latvia. And this was in early May, end of April. It's a month later. And this village, according to Russian media, I can't confirm it, but according to Russian media, this village is still without hot water. It's been a month now. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the reasons that the, the officials in Latvia now give for, for there being no hot water is that it's just not solvent. It's not solvent for the, for the village, for the authorities for the water authorities, nor for the citizens. We assess the solvency of citizens at a tariff of 198 euros. How much interest could they pay such an amount? This means that the debt to the company 
would have grown, the obligations of the company would have increased, and thirdly, the municipality conducted a poll about turning off hot water. Most of those participating voted for turning it off. So I used a, a machine translation from Russian media, but I think you get the picture that uh, the water authorities, the municipality in this town said, look, this is what's going to happen. At 198 uh, euros per, uh, per megawatt uh, hour, what you're going to have is you're going to have citizens unable to pay. They're just simply not going to be able to pay for, uh, for hot water. You're going to have bills mounting up. You're going to have the government having to, to do some sort of bailout. The, uh, the water authorities are going to be put in a, in a mess as well, trying to deal with all of these bills and these outstanding payments. And uh, it just doesn't make economic sense. That was the, the message that, uh, that he was giving. And he's kind of right. He's right. So I think this is something that's going to be coming to most of, uh, of Europe and most of the collective West. I don't know if... Um, I can't confirm if the water, if hot water is, is still after one month not running in Latvia, but uh, be prepared everybody because I think this is going to be a scenario come October that um, we're all going to have to deal with. So I will leave it there. That is the clown world. My coffee shop is actually right down the street over there, but uh, I took a little bit of, uh, of a detour just a little bit, like a couple minutes detour, and I ended up in all kinds of, uh, of interesting places here in the center of, uh, of Plaka, Athens, Greece. Okay, everybody, check out Alexander's um, channel check out the Durand's channel. We did a great live stream with Jacob Dreisen the other day. Fantastic live stream. Check that out on the Duran. I am signing out. It's coffee time. Take care.